Welcome to Experience Focus Leaders. I am excited to introduce you to my friend of many years, uh, CEO of Culture Gene, Brett Putter. Brett is one of the foremost experts in the intersection of building a high performance culture and operating either in remote or hybrid environment. Um, he's the author of two books. Uh, culture decks decoded and own your culture brett welcome to the pod alex uh great to be to be on the pod it's uh, been a while since uh, we last caught up in london but uh, yeah really good to reconnect and uh, and and sh learn from you and uh, hopefully to share some insights amazing well brett you're like at the at the something that any um uh forward thinking leader should be obsessing about in my view right by definition we all live either in uh, you know large parts of organizations being remote by default and you know the rest being in some kind of a hybrid mode um i think historically we were relying on hey let's all get in a room and in you know observe what other people are doing kind of get the culture through osmosis um, through, um, uh, you know, the, some kind of role modeling that just happening, you know, in every meeting and in every interaction, higher, higher density of feedback when you're in a face-to-face -face environment, right? Like you get more, more vibes through that from other people. Now that world, um, has mostly changed, but the, uh, the the culture problem is even bigger because a lot of people have not even had that kind of gap, right? They're joining organizations that they've never met anybody in that organization in person, and they're supposed to be the leaders in that organization. And and I think it's kind of causing all sorts of um, a heartburn for people that are able to spot it. What are you seeing as the most uh, typical challenges for, let's say, high growth um, organization that's dealing with hiring and maintaining culture in this environment. Yeah, so I think the the your point about the world has changed is very relevant because the world has changed, but leaders and leadership has not. And this is the first challenge: is we've the the world has changed but we're still working or leading as if we were in the office five days a week right ultimately and this this is because mainly because none of our none of the leaders or the vast majority of the leaders in companies have not experienced what it means to work in a an organization that was set up to be remote first from the beginning um, they don't. Yes, we had two years of pandemic remote work, but that's not the same as being in an environment where there are remote work best practices, where they know how to spot the challenges of remote work and overcome them. So I think that really is the first challenge is at the at the leadership level. Well, and, and I kind of want to double down on that in in the sense that like the world has changed, but we're still carbon based life forms, right? We have not changed. You know, our brains have the crocodile components and have like the sort of the limbic components that are disconnected from um, from the cerebral parts of our our, our natures. And I think there's th this environment is not necessarily the same environment that the species has functioned with, like for many years, where like we we have these bonding moments when we are together in a physical space. And so I'm really curious, how do you see the, both this on the leadership level, but also on an individual level? Like, where do people find the energy when they are, you know, on back-to-back -back Zooms and you know, Slack channels, right? Like, what, what are you finding that brings humanity and meets those fundamental needs of working together with others? Uh, historically, it's been done in physical space. So if you're in back to meet, back to back to back meetings and Zoom, you're doing it wrong. Okay. Um, that's fundamentally it. It means that you are 
you're not really working. You are in meetings. And okay. that means that you have to work after you have your meetings. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, I spent 14 months studying remote work companies. So I looked at GitLab, Buffer, Zapier, Toptel, Duist, Automatic, Hotjar, and a bunch of others. And actually, these companies default towards asynchronous communication so that they can re respond when they need to or, or when they want to. And they can work when they need to, when they want to. So that's actually the, the, the first point is if that is what you're experiencing, it's you're doing it wrong. Um, when it comes to connection, uh, we're used to building connection and building community in an office environment. And that was much easier to do because we'd bump into people, et cetera, et cetera. And now we're finding it harder to build connection. And actually there is disconnection. There's disconnection from people and there's disconnection from our culture. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that is because the systems inside companies, the system is wrong for the way we work now. Mm. So we're still using the pre-pandemic operating system. Mm. But actually, we now have a post-pandemic operating system. And so it and so we are expecting somehow for this post-pandemic operating system to evolve itself quickly. And we're expecting that these things that we had in the office to be replicated uh automatically. And that's just not going to happen. So ultimately, what we're talking about is an operating system change, which people do leaders, it terrifies leaders because especially high growth companies, they, they, they're they struggling to, to balance all the plates uh, that are spinning at a thousand miles an hour. And now you're saying, hold on, but the, like the underlying ground that the plates are spinning on is wrong. So let, let's come back to the operating system. But let, let's kind of touch on the async uh, topic that you brought up. So, you know, you bring up companies, GitLab, for example, right? GitLab famously was, you know, async, uh, wiki-based communications, everything written down way before, before the pandemic. Um, and... Uh, you know, has been very much building it in public, right? So it just kind of has this sort of DNA. It has like really useful, you know, content and their processes. Everything is documented, but also it's an open source driven uh, a company, right? Mm -hmm. Where open source is where this kind of collaboration with participants and you know, typically techie DNA has been, you know, the DNA of the movement, right? Contrast that to a, um, let's say, um, uh, small to medium-sized business sales organizations, right? Like historically, they would be sitting in a in a kind of in a, in a in the same bullpen area and kind of you know motivating each other and kind of having the sort of camaraderie that helps you know sport like sportsman sports team like was a little bit of competitiveness. And then, but then in parallel, like you have enterprise sales organizations, you would have a, you know, senior, you know, uh, field, uh, field account executive with a $2 million quota that's up operating in, you know, Chicago area. And he kind of flies in for some, some meetings, but he, he, his or her job is to be with the customer. So also kind of operating remotely. So there are these cultures in the past that had pockets of, you know, successful remote, um, remote organization, but it, it almost feels like the, if I think of the field exec, right, that's a, somebody who's already further in their career, they've been trained up in some ways, so like earlier, they have a basic skill set around sales. And if I think about open source, it's kind of like, um, you know, it's its own, it's its own animal with its own dynamics and people are drawn to that movement. Um, when they kind of they are not the people that may need a lot of you know day to day interaction. So now this is spread outside of these pockets to let's say very large chunks of the organization. And so, what are you seeing that's working? You know, what we can take from those lessons of pre pandemic success, right? And what's not uh, what's not scaling in in other parts of an organization as easily. As maybe um, uh, in the in the um, in the sort of organizations predisposed to remote first. So I think I think the 
the sales organization is a particularly interesting one because there there are certain sales teams that and sales leaders that thrive on that drive, that dynamism, that um, typically younger uh, salesperson who needs that drive and push. Mm-hmm. And I'm not say, I'm I'm, I'm saying I'm not saying that you shouldn't necessarily get those people together more regularly, um, mm-hmm. but they don't have to be in the office all the time um, mm-hmm. necessarily. It really depends on once again the operating system because ultimately there is a um, there is a there is a leadership style mm. that is driving that that behavior. There is a leadership style of I need to see you. I need to use my charisma to to uh, motivate you or force you or pressurize you to do that next deal to get on the phone to 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 drive drive drive. And actually, you see you see this in in uh, studies done. So Georgia mm. Southern University did a study where they took 110 leaders and they said you they took 110 teams and they said four people in each team go and work in an office and choose your leader. Then they said they took 110 teams, four people in each team, and they said go and work remote and choose your leader. And the office based leaders were charismatic, vocal and hierarchical interesting mm. the remote leaders were coaches facilitators me- facilitators mentors and project managers so it's a fundamentally there's a fundamentally different style and a different way of working in both of in 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 office versus remote so that's fascinating um and that's unexpected which is great for our listeners so the i i would have assumed that in if you're remote, it's even more critical to kind of convey the energy and kind of be the sort of you know bring in the charisma and the passion. How? Uh, fun, like I well, I'll tell you what I've been trying to do. I don't know. I, you, you'll ask my team how you know they'll they'll tell you how um, you know how 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 it's working or not. But I think the I I it got to a point where I would sometimes read a poem that really moves me to the team and you know she, like like was it was a view and it would be like an all hands meeting but it's a it's a poem that has kind of like a appeal on a human level and sort of connects people in and like like brings them in an emotional state right it, and it's got lines with our culture hopefully right like i think that's sort of like the intent was i did to me that's an inspirational um that's not charismatic you know, well, yeah. it's not that, you, you no, should no, no. you should wait. You should hear me read it. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually that's actually so. Ultimately, what you're doing is you're connecting on a human level with your team. You're not demonstrating charisma. You're not demonstrating leadership through your personality and the 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 force of your communication and the way you interact in a in a in a physical way. You're actually more connecting with them on a on an emotional level which you felt they needed which which shows the emotional intelligence you need to run a remote organization mm. so that for me is 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 not charisma if you think about charisma think about steve barmer standing on stage sweating buckets of sweat motivating developers them. Developers, developers developers that's that's, that's on the wrong side of the spectrum but, but that's that's all the no, i don't think that was motivating for developers either to be honest if i don't like i I'm, I'm a son of a developer i'm a i i, I work with developers <laughs> Some of <laughs> some of the best developers are my friends, and I think they find that ridiculous. <laughs> but, but that's that's the extreme of what I'm talking yeah. about. You know that in person interaction where yeah. come on, come on, yeah. you can do it. Go and do yeah. another call. But, you know versus right, right. versus right. how can I facilitate? How can I how can I create the environment where you do the best work? And yeah. yes, you, you may have younger employees who are less experienced, and yes, you may have to pull them into the office more. But that mm. doesn't mean they have to be in the office all the time. Right. That's fascinating. Now, um, on that note, so like, let's say, kind of, how do you, as a leader in this re- remote or hybrid organization, how do you lift up the energy level? Because I think this is what we're talking about. Like, so if, if charisma and rah, rah, rah is not a way to do it, 
right? Um, what are other ways to do it? So like, I've, I'll get to throw out some ideas. So we, um, we, we have a, um, a, we're building customer centric product, right? The idea is that it, so we're, you know, taking your, those culture decks and making them digestible by the audience, making them real concrete, bringing them, bringing those examples to live, making it easy to find the relevant. So, that takes a view that requires for us to be um, driving customer centricity. And so for our clients and for ourselves, right. And sometimes the customers are also not in your, you know, sometimes you, you know, used to meet with them in the past, right. Like, especially the enterprise, the big relationships now it's harder, right. So a lot of it is remote. So one of the ways that we do it is we talk about customers in our zoom meet and, you know, all hands, we have a dedicated place for a customer, uh, you know, relate to customer in search of wow. Like that's like, that's, we have that kind of as a reminder and the person who's running that kind of, you know, behind, they like, they like things. They, they, they kind of respond to certain things. They respond, they celebrate things. So they're kind of like, it's a, it's a reminder of like, well, what's the bigger, who are we looking out for? If not just ourselves, right? Like we're looking out for the customer. The second thing is we keep reinforcing the mission and the power of what we're doing, you know, and that kind of hopefully sends every now and again, sends shivers down the spine for somebody to say, Hey, we're working on reinventing the book, right? Like you, you're the author, like, Hey, who are these, who's this like in large, in, in, in relative terms, tiny, band of of people that's kind of taking on the book right like the the kind of the the transfer of human knowledge experience right and and you know empowering it with whatever new technology there is and so that kind of th those things is what we're in our little startup at relate to we're that's how we're thinking about you know, bringing up the energy and the relevance and connecting to the bigger idea so people don't get lost in the okay everyday challenges what are you seeing other companies do, right? Like this is not enough, right? Like there's got to be more, more ways um, to lift up the overall energy level. It's 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 not enough. What what you're doing is critical. Uh, mm. It's they it's e very easy for somebody working in a remote environment to forget why they're doing it and mm. forget the purpose because they've got the cat that needs feeding or the the their their the daughter needs to be taken to school or whatever it is. And right. so it's quite easy to forget the 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 the, the mission and the vision and, and 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 the purpose and 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 the values. They they, mm. they they when you're in an office, you experience it more. You you and it's easier for leaders to call it out in an office. You know, well done, Jack. You did this. That's living our values. Mm. Um, so actually, what you're doing is 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 great. The next level down is mm. is about building, ultimately building social capital across the organization. So social capital is the value I get from, from first of all, knowing the organization and secondly, the organization knowing me. So, so it's actually more important for people to know you than it is for you to know people, but that's a, a longer story. But ultimately, social capital is, is, is um, this oil that makes the organization uh, run smoother. If I if I reach out to Bob in sales and Bob in sales has never heard of me before, Bob may take a day or two to get back to me. But if Bob and I had a drink two weeks ago, he'd probably respond quicker. So it's that it's that social connection, and it doesn't come. It, it it's it's super important, and it doesn't come easy in a remote environment. So what you've got to think about is you've got to think about the the two types of proximity that you have in a work environment. You have mm. physical proximity which is I can see you, you're in the same room. Mm. And you have emotional proximity. Yeah. Now, emotional proximity is being seen, being recognized, and people and understanding that people understand the value I bring to this. So emotional proximity can, can be used very effectively by leaders to overcome the lack of physical proximity. Mm. And you do that by focusing on the moments that matter for mm. your people. So the moments that matter for your people are personal things like birthdays, kids, birthdays, et cetera, et cetera. The, the moments that matter are overcoming a, a, a tough project. The moments that matter are hitting a target. The moments that matter are the things that you can hook around and show the person, I see you, 
I value you and I recognize you for this moment that matters. And I may mm. even call it out again, just to remind you that I spotted that moment that matters. And so this is how, how you can go beyond the, 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 that first layer of culture and go deeper into social capital and building social capital inside your organization through moments that matter, both individually, but also to the broader group. Hmm. So actually, I, I want to give you a shout out on this because we, when we chatted back in December, both one on one and as part of a group where of entrepreneurs, where you're kind of offering some some of these perspectives, Brett, um, I picked up on that, and I think we were doing some of these things, but um, we um, we probably weren't as systematic about it as as um, as we started after you've uh, made that recommendation. So I'll actually provide feedback. On Thank you. some of how some of your ideas are working. So on this sort of creating emotional connection, probably one of the you'll ask our team one of the most favorite things that we started doing, and I picked that up from you is doing breakouts in Zoom during our meetings, right? And the meetings became, you know, a lot less about kind of overall goals and you know the usual the usual stuff. We still have we have to do some of that, but. Um, the breakouts were like the types of questions you would ask, uh, you know, your spouse, right? Like if you're trying to get kind of to really understand them, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, tell, tell me about something that, ha you know, that really influenced you when you were, you know, between the age of 10 and 13, right? Like, and so pe like, it's amazing how people would like, would not want to come back from breakout rooms or, and they would like, they would <laughs> kind of come back. They said they really enjoyed getting to know their colleagues and, and, you know, there are some surprises and common threads, but the, it kind of, it, it, it's stopped away from being like a cult of the leaders talking, right? Like, you know, like the, you know, communicating a little bit, like you said, top down, kind of what's the latest news and became much more participatory so that the meetings became, you, everybody had to like really be part of it. But in, in, most importantly, it's just been that the kind of the, 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 the questions were um, designed to, to connect emotionally with somebody and, and share, find shared humanity across those Zooms, right? And especially if you have really diverse cultural, culturally mm -hmm. diverse teams, which we do. And I think many organizations that are kind of uh, operating across um, cultures, not just remote, um, need to work even harder on, on making sure that we find that humanity as well. Um, so, th so that's kind of one one example. And then, obviously, like celebrate, like creating a formal space to celebrate things that happened. And then the last piece that's what we've been doing for a while. We we sing the world's most asynchronous Zoom uh, happy birthday for people, and it's like a a transition because if you know anybody who's figured out how to make it sync up, let, let us know. But it's so bad, it's it's good. It's, you know? it's very good. Yeah, I, can, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to change it at all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so like something anyway, I, but, but people to. love this, right? Like, and it's sort of these are the moments. And one time we had the birthday of a, of a, like one of our colleagues' wife was there. You know, and it was she it was her birthday, and so we sang the happy birthday to her right because she is extend like he is you know she's the core part of his life and he's core part of our team and you know it's sort of it kind of reminded us that it's sort of you know we are there also to support the partners uh of our team members and that was that was even cooler right then in in some ways because mm -hmm. it just sort of humanized this person like they're not just a sort of embodiment here and like in zoom they're they're a full human being was a wife or or kids um so uh, what what are your reactions to this kind of uh, anecdote right like is this what you expected is there more to build on this one if we're starting to see the value of um what you're describing like what would you recommend as kind of quick wins for people for small organizations so so one of the things just to follow on the, the comment um, about the, the singing happy birthday to the wife, um, one of the things that a CEO that I spoke to recently does is he actually sends the, um, the, the penny, you'll find out beforehand, um, but it's either, <laughs> you'll either send flowers or chocolates 
um, mm. to the partner of the of, of the of of the person who's joined. Um, and it's just and th there's a handwritten letter that says, uh, you know, thanks so much. Uh, just want to I just want to show our appreciation because you know we know how hard it is to be a partner in in, in a working environment. And it's really great to have your partner join us, and and we see you as as part of our extended family. So thank you. We appreciate your 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 support, however that may be. And it makes it makes such a big difference because you they've just hired this person, and then the partner gets this this completely customized handwritten uh, measure of appreciation, which which just you know it, it it's it's a it's a bonding moment between between two people and the company versus just the in, the new employee in the company, so they're just they're clever things that that you can do to once you've interviewed the candidate and you know they they married they got two kids you know you can send them a a, a, a box of chocolates or something it's, it's it doesn't take much but it's a very smart thing to do um, I think the 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 this idea of of social connection and emotional proximity feeds back into one of the things that the remote work companies that I've studied do, which is they, they do more one-to-ones typically than, than organizations would have done pre-pandemic. Um, and so they teams are smaller, teams are no bigger than seven. And and in the case of Hotjar, for example, they do one, they do weekly one-to-ones. And the one-to-ones are led by the the individual, not by the manager. So mm. the individual writes the agenda and the individual will um, will state what they want to talk about. The manager does have some questions in the back. They, they, the manager never drives the conversation ever. Um, and actually, so, so what then happens is instead of it being an update on how's your performance, they have a, a document that details performance over time. So they start off going, you know, this week or this month, this is what you're expected to achieve. And they just follow on that document. So you so you have a personal meeting with the individual, finding out how they are, how they doing. If they want to talk about performance and the things they're struggling with, that's not a problem. But ultimately, the manager is managing the relationship, not the performance. If there is a performance meeting that's required, they will schedule one. But they can see by the project and the progress of the project documentation and updates on performance how the person is performing, and they'll know whether they need to step in or monitor or get involved or train based on the work on that work that they've done so let me clarify so the the when you're referring to as the the document of performance this is something that's run independently of the meeting and so you just you what you're saying is you have that async right some kind of a reporting documentation and that you know that could be the source of like problem solving and you know, adjusting in, in the meeting, but it doesn't have to be the, the source, right? And it's, it opens it's up, up time for other areas. It's up to the individual who you, mm. if you're, if you're the manager and you're meeting with, and with your, one of your team members, if they want to, if they are struggling with something, it's up to them to put it in the agenda to discuss with you. If they're not struggling with anything, they don't. So, so that's interesting. So let's, let's kind of, um, you mentioned the kind of the whole operating system is changing. So like mm. one of the, um, things that are where it's a little bit less visible, right? If you're in a sync environment in some ways, right? Like what's working, what's not. So you brought up this document. So what are you seeing people change in how they communicate progress, right? And and I think uh, both in one-to-ones and then across a broader team where some kind of alignment is required to avoid duplicative efforts and you know conflictual directions where well-intentioned people could often go that are don't communicate enough. So so this is once again a big, big operating system shift that um that companies are not ready for yet. But ultimately the best the best example I've seen of this is where um there's uh, Andy Grove of uh, in high output management uh, coined the phrase task relevant maturity. And task relevant maturity is a, um, a framework to help uh, typically leaders of junior or inexperienced uh, individuals or people. Um, but actually it's applicable in, 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 in any framework. So in any environment. So 
if you have a high task relevant maturity, it means that you've done this task before numerous times and you can do it well. And mm. we're confident of that. If you have a low task relevant maturity, it means that you haven't done this task before or you've done it once or twice and you're not confident and you're not going to be good at it. And so what you do is you take this idea of task relevant maturity and you look at a project and you go, okay, this project has six tasks that you have mm. to complete between now and the middle of March. Mm, okay. Mm. Have you done these six tasks in the past? I've uh, high task relevant maturity. I, yes, I've done this project three times. Okay. See you in the middle of March. Let me know if there are any problems. Okay. Bye. Now as a manager, I know that Bob has high task relevant maturity. Bob's done it before. Bob's going to nail this thing. And if he's struggling because of someone else in the team or an outside factor, he will let me know. Mm. But when it comes to Jack, Jack is new. Jack has just joined the team. He's got six things in his six tasks in his project, but Jack's only done two of those tasks well, properly before. So I know I have to, I have to train him and I have to monitor him and I have to mentor him through four of those tasks. If I don't do this, if I don't take this task relevant maturity basis to this, Jack is going to not really know what he has to do. Jack's going to have to have meetings with people to understand what he has to do. Jack's new, so he's going to be insecure about these meetings and insecure about asking all these questions. Jack is not, uh, we don't have enough documentation, so Jack can't read up about it. Yeah. So what does Jack do? Jack is scared. Jack is has got one foot out the door already. So, so onboarding people and then giving them the system, an operating system to work effectively, whether they have high task relevant maturity or low task relevant maturity is super, super important. So, so one of the takeaways is a playbooks, right? And really um, up-to-date documentation of how to do certain things. Because again, if you're going async, <laughs> right? Like then that mentoring capacity right is is limited to certain hours of the day right alignment etc right and and if what if people are part time you know it's like it kind of even complicates it further and then i think you bring up something um that is a challenge I, I, like historically been a challenge for remote uh, environments um where you kind of the people that thrive in them are the people that are, have already been trained in in some at least basic like maybe not in company level process but in basic level kind of how to do sales they're already familiar with that so they don't need to be trained in something like that and then they are just basically need to adapt whatever their core skill set is to the company's policies and so on and and then separately the sort of the classical startup hire is somebody who even if they haven't been trained, just has the DNA to go learn fast, figure stuff out, you know, move, move despite um, like full clarity. And, you know, whether that's a kind of a unicorn person, that's really a founder, right. That's, you know, not everybody's like that, but it kind of still want to be in the startup. That's kind of a separate question that I have for you. Is it, is it like, are some organizations just doomed you know, because they're too early in the process, there's too little structure. And so they just need the right people to handle that level of ambiguity and like that are agile to figure stuff out on their own. Um, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think I think the, uh, if you look at the way um, most remo most pre-pandemic or most remote <clears throat> companies recruit recruited, was hiring for self-management, people who can manage themselves. Mm. And people who can manage themselves will go out and find the information that they can and then be able to communicate and say, I've got this amount of information. This is what I'm missing. Um, I don't think doomed is the right word, but I do think that you know, ultimately in a high growth environment, it's about speed. You know, the quickest to market, the quickest to, to achieving certain milestones, et cetera. So I think that the uh, the friction that develops in a remote working environment is something that over time 
all high growth companies or any company should be looking to overcome. So finding where remote friction is happening and then overcoming that through process definition or documentation or moving to async communication. These, these are, I, I know for most high growth CEOs, it's literally like, Brett, are you mad? I'm trying to survive. And now you're telling me I must, uh, I must go and get somebody to write a document about that process. But at some stage, it has to happen. Because mm. the, the because the friction just will grind the business to 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 almost a standstill, and human beings are incredibly adaptable, incredibly good good at, at at finding ways to do things. But if you facilitate it, and if you if you build a system for them from the outset, if you have the system mindset around what did we do that's not working, that's that's building up all this friction, and how do I overcome that friction? Um, over time, it's not you know nothing's going to happen magically overnight. But if you but if you have that mindset over the next two, three, four, five years as you build your startup, you will build a system that is that is built fit for purpose for a flexible work environment. So so what I'm hearing is it like it re still requires a mindset of people that are able to go and say, hey, I'm gonna document things. I'm gonna have a process. I'm gonna have to like kind of almost go down the path of debugging. Um that that still is a kind of a, a personality, <laughs> you know, or or kind of a, a hiring fit potentially. Do you agree with that? Or is that a something that you think everybody can can learn? Is that a learned behavior? But that's 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 a little bit like saying um let me try and think of a that's not a good enough example. There there are there are if you if you're gonna work in a remote work environment and you don't document things. It's 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 literally where is the information? What decisions were taken? How do I know? Let my colleagues know the people who are going to be impacted by this. We don't have an office that's going to be going to be effective in in sharing and 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 facilitating the flow of this information. I mean, if you if you don't see that as a reality, then okay, then 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 you must run your business your way. Uh, in some in some organizations where people are um, let's say uh, less uh, enamored with with writing and documentation, I've seen companies accept video. Right. So instead yep. of writing, just talk to just just video or just record it, and we will transcribe it. But once again, this is a system mindset. You need if you don't if it's not documented, and you go from uh, 80 people to 300 people on two different continents. The chaos that you are going to have to deal with is immense. So, so what we're here, what I'm kind of hearing is that fundamentally, this is part of that new operating system that you cannot have, hey three executives had a quick zoo a quick zoom meeting and they came to a decision and there is no you know there's some sort of a to do but there's like there's no clear record of that and clear learnings from why that happened so that kind of osmosis or past experience somehow needs to start getting uh captured in a more consistent way mm -hmm. So let's shift gears uh, a little bit and let's go to pre-pandemic, an example of a company who's probably uh, uh, supporting some of those remote workers was entertainment, Netflix. Um, you, you wrote about them in the, your Culture Decks Decoded and about their famous uh, Culture Deck. And I'll just quote you, um, Netflix communicates in clear and simple language, how living the values, the actual behaviors, and the skills that are demonstrated by fellow employees will all help to get a new employee rewarded and promoted or fired if he or she fails to live up to the values. So let's talk about how that um, culture deck, which has you know, been sometimes described as the most important document to come out of Silicon Valley, if you were to write it for today, um, what would it be 
you know, at the, assuming you're Netflix, right? Like how, how different would it be in a remote first and, you know, probably more multi-product business that is Netflix, right? If it, if it changes, um, would there be any differences there? So there's a couple of things. Netflix are one of the organizations that want everybody back in the office. Mm. And that that is their that is their operating system that they want. Mm. And, I, and and whether whether I agree or disagree with it, it doesn't matter. It's the way they want to run their business. And I think that's right. If <clears throat> if they are confident that they will be able to recruit all the people that they're going to need to recruit over the next 10 years by having offices and by attracting people close by or moving people, trans, uh, you know, relocating people, then and uh, then that's uh, then that's and not giving their people the flexibility that they may want, then that's absolutely fine. But that confidence and decision making is is uh, uh, you know build the culture you want. So that's the first point. The second point about that culture deck is that culture deck um, is still the is still mostly I would say ninety five percent of is it still relevant today. Mm. Mm. Some words have been changed on mm. the value side, but they still have the keeper test. They still look for excellence. They will, they will, you know, they will bench you and then they will fire you if you're not, if you're not delivering excellence. They still in, they still encourage you to go and and understand what your market value is. Um and and actually that 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 consistency of their culture is amazing. Mm. It's 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 incredible. And that's why. You know, I know they've reworded it somewhat, and and but it's still the culture, and it's and it's you know if you go and have a look at their their values page on the internet now, it's uh, actually their corporate page. It I think that I think there's of the nine values, seven of them are still the same, and and the wording is pretty much mostly the same. Um, it's not as detailed now because people have read the culture deck and and people can access that culture deck, which is still close enough. So mm. I wouldn't personally based on Netflix's desire to be an in-person culture, I wouldn't change it at all. So my sense is that what you're saying is it's, um, it, there's actually two, like you answered a separate question is this is like this, if you have a culture and it's a, it's a strong driver of who you are uh, or everybody has a culture, but if you have a culture deck and it's a strong kind of documentation of the culture that doesn't change, you know, that's sort of, that's a, that's just living, breathing. It might adapt slightly, but it sounds like it doesn't change for most organizations. If if you um, if the CEO if the founder stays in and has a very strong understanding, uh, which Reed did, and does a very good job of the initial uh, documentation, which they did, then yeah, it shouldn't. It, it it can tweak. I think principles change over time, but value shouldn't. They can, but they shouldn't. So wh one of the reasons again, I also wanted to chat is we are you know, wearing my other hat at relate to, we're seeing a lot of um, employee communications uh, show up in using, using relate to, which is a way to make it more human, more digital, more like engaging digital experience. So we see culture handbooks, we see culture decks, um, we see employee benefit communications that align with that organization's kind of mission and kind of how, it wants to to treat its employees and and their extended um, families and you know loved ones, and um, the kind of theme that we're seeing is uh, you know almost congruence, right? So if you're saying, "Hey, we're easy to work at," right, and then you pro show people like a very hard to read, hard to understand hard to digest something that that's kind of incongruent and it doesn't really work. If you're saying um, we're exciting and then you bore people to tears with your culture deck or whatever, whatever communications are uh, that doesn't work. If you're saying we walk the talk and you have something that's highly abstract and doesn't have concrete examples, then it's sort of it's it's just you know talk right like and there's there's nothing to walk, and so we we're seeing some of these like like forward thinking organizations generally like like that are they're looking for an edge in engaging uh, their their employees sometimes it's their extended employees could be like contracting 
folks could be kind of, you know, like we have a um, company that has runs d dental clinics. And so some of their, some of the folks they need to engage are not their employees, they, but they are part of the kind of clinic. Um, so they, they go to extraordinary lengths to actually humanize, create videos, kind of create a com common sense through, again, these values, the magazines, the newsletters, uh, because the kind of the lame mo intranet post or kind of email just doesn't do it anymore. People are really stepping up. And I'm curious if you're seeing that level of kind of merging digital with human, uh, you know, come up in some of the leading organizations in this, right? Because the wiki, you know, it's good for documentation, but it doesn't lift up the human spirit in a way that, you know, a more visual and kind of immersive experience could. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you've seen that pattern as well. I'm, I'm seeing it on a, on a really... Yeah. Uh, like simple level if you if you you if you get if you get an email from somebody who works at a well-run remote company and you get an email from any other company you'll notice often that the the, the remote company email has emojis in it mm. now the now emojis are a super powerful way to communicate how you're feeling and where you're mm. at and a lot of people look at emojis as these silly silly images like why would you put a silly thing there but actually if you look at lots and lots of remote work companies, it's part of, uh, they, they even build their own, they design their own emojis, like mm. brand, uh, brand based and, and values based emojis. Um, so that, so that they can enhance this communication, they can make it more human um, and more emotional or more connecting. And I think that's what, what, what relate to is doing is, is allowing uh, people who would get some form of, of uh, diverse interaction in an office environment to get that from this digital experience. Um, and so from a, from a, a, a well-run environment where remote is dominant, you see a lot of this where it's sharing of images, sharing of what we did last weekend, sharing of... Uh, videos of the kids or the cat internally within the organization. Um, so yes, this this is a, a the remote companies are looking for ways to enhance the connection without meeting. They yes, they do meet and they meet once, twice yeah. a year or more than that sometimes. But it's 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 physical, it's emotional proximity. They're trying yeah. to increase and strengthen the emotional proximity of the experience in the company. And this is really, this is really, you know, a great point. And you keep, you brought up video and async video. So one of the advantages is like, yes, I don't have to write. If I'm not a writer, I could do a video. But the other advantage is the video communicates more powerfully an emotion in, you know, what, what, who's the human behind it. Um, now the challenge has been historically that like, if you're doing full screen video recording, you know, there may be some equipment things. There's, there's kind of like some people, some people maybe slightly become self-conscious when they look at themselves in a video. And so they kind of, they start re-recording it 15 times and it's like, this is too much painful. Let's just hop on a call. Right. And, or like, so there's this sort of, um, learn change in behavior. And I think over time, more and more of us will be more comfortable with the sort of the video-based one-to-many uh, async communications. Um, but one of the things that we found that's really interesting on that note um, is the, you know, like, let's say you have a deck and then you have like a small, you can add, you know, to a particular page that's highly important or confusing or something you want to emphasize, or maybe the introductory page, you add a small you know, small kind of instantly recorded video of a CEO talking through something or kind of a, a regional leader, you know, t giving an update on top of a, what would be dry information, a heavy slide is just giving mm -hmm. some emo emotional color. And that's been a surprise. We got pulled into building that out because people wanted that human touch, whether it's to a customer presentation or future customer, but surprisingly, a lot of like the, the early thing was rem like 
you know, remote first uh, kind of company in Australia, right? Like, which is, as we know, pretty, pretty uh, large country and then happened to have a very distributed um, organization. So it was very hard for them, even pre-pandemic, getting people, you know, together. So that, that became, um, you know, an insight that I think just we're seeing more and more of this desire to connect and humanize. And it feels like video is one dimension, but then the other one, and, and I'm, I'm kind of wondering how we're seeing these organizations work through this is we are all kind of overloaded with information, right? Everybody's complains about endless Slack, right? Everybody complains about endless Zoom meetings, right? Um, there is like, you're saying, hey, let's document everything, right? Like, well, that's just a lot more stuff to try to find the right resource. Not, so, not, every, not everything. No, Don't document everything. Document, or repeatable, repeatable. Document what's relevant. Relevant, right. But still, there's there's a lot more content. Let's just kind of like, it's probably not a big argument to say there's mm -hmm. a lot more content. So one of the things that we've been seeing kind of was kind of more because our customers tend to be more innovative, you know, and like trying to, to tackle this either on behalf of themselves, their partners, their customers is what they're doing is they're kind of pre presenting a lot more. Here's an overall architecture of all the key things uh, that may like that are relevant. And then of those, you pick your own adventure to get quickly to the one thing that's really relevant for you. And so they're building these sort of as an like almost introduction deck to all the other decks that exist, uh, you know, elsewhere, right? Introduction deck to our values, introduction deck to this newsletter, right? And so people are increasingly able to feel like they're in control and they don't have this monologue of like, blah, 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 you know, one person talking, uh, you know, or equivalent of a slide that you have to go through linearly to get to the part that you care about on page 84, on your phone right and and that seems to be the other trend um that you know that's like in addition to humanizing and documenting the relevant pits it's also like getting people to that right information what are you seeing you know that uniquely being somehow relevant to remote and distributed kind of high, hybrid hybrid organizations is there more of a challenge around information there uh, is it same as everywhere else? And what are you seeing some of the most innovative companies you, you work with do around that? So I'm, so I'm, I was speaking to, um, Job, who's the founder and CEO of remote.com. And I was talking to him about documentation and he, and he said that his target that he is aiming for is for anybody in the organization to be able to find anything that they want, the relevant documentation in less than 20 seconds. Hmm. And he said, we're not there. It's, 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 it's a big challenge, but that's, that's ultimately what we're aiming for is the ability to, to, to get to the right information uh, as quickly as possible and then get to, that even inside that information, the right information is is really important. I'm seeing people play around with AI, um, but it's too early to to really have a. I don't have an opinion, and I haven't seen. I haven't. I haven't got any concrete results um, using AI in 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 this sense. I think your your point about your customers being quite uh innovative um i think that that you if if i was if if i was thinking about your customer i think there needs to be an intentionality around around communication and an intentionality around um the culture and the culture of communication and for me that 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 would be you know it would, it would from more from my point of view users of relate to uh, would be would would I would just I would just put them in a bucket of interesting cultures. You know, they 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 must be some sort of intentionality there um, because they, they care they, about the audience. Like I think they the like the defining thread is they care about the the message is important to them and the audience is important to them, and so they want to get the message. They want to, to deliver. The it, yeah, they yeah. don't want to deliver it to the. 
they're like, if you just like, hey, you know, this is just kind of a quick email and there's one other person and uh, yeah, that we're not the, you know, go use Google Docs or PowerPoint or whatever. The, but if it's a, you know, one to few, one to many or like really important audience, really key stakeholders, we want to respect them. We want to show them a sign that we care about, you know, them and we care enough about the message to make it accessible right mm. and that degree will vary right like from ai is like you know like for example for employee benefits ai is amazing our clients that are using that like hey i, I need to figure out fertility benefits like you know the only way to do that right now is like to go through control f through like 15 documents to really understand it and then you will just see the word fertility you won't get the answer and the likeliest page in the right document was an answer that you could then go validate, right? Imagine you could skip that and really make make a you know, much more informed decision across a library of content that doesn't have any kind of crazy stuff in there from general, you know, AI tools. That's really powerful. And it's sort of not a use case we thought of initially, but it sort of creates the sort of out of the noise, helps people get to the right nugget very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and it, um, it sort of again signals that we don't want to hide behind the small print. We want to be accessible. We are we, every interaction is about building trust. And how do you build trust? Well, we help you kind of to to that point of your of remote.com leader. We help you get to the right information, you know, and we help you then double check if you need the the details and the footnotes and everything, right? If you're that person or if you come from an evidenced based culture, we need to provide the summary and the quick access with the backup if you need it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the only way that I see, like generally for society, it feels like that's a good way to build trust, right? Like, you, you know, you kind of got to provide some kind of a framework for people not to get lost in the weed of the details. But then once they get to the relevant bits, see what's kind of what's backing them up. Um, so I, you kind of back to broadly telling you, I know you, you think about global issues, right? Like, but we've talked about, you know, startups and it may be high growth companies quite a bit, but how do you see this changing the overall culture? Like as you know, for, for societies, as we are kind of feeling, you know, we're all more remote, right? We, we have, um, increasingly, you know, less, less physical gatherings in our kind of, uh, social, maybe kind of civic lives, you know, how are you thinking that some of the lessons that you're learning could be adopted by other organizations? Yeah. Once again, if you think, if you look at what remote work companies do, they don't, they actually encourage, and in some cases they fund involvement on a local level. So mm. in your village or in your town or in your city, what do you want to do to go and give back? What do you want to do to, to, and, and we will maybe, if you're into animals and helping at the animal shelter, we will, you know, give you 50 euros a year to go and maybe buy some animal feed or whatever it is, you know, they, but, but there is a, there is a, uh, a localization element of connecting with the, the, the your, your local environment and getting to understand that the people you live near and you live around, um, the, 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 the remote work companies that I've worked with and interviewed do not feel like they are missing out on connection. Interesting. Because the system is the right amount of connection. If I want to go and join a, uh, a lunch and learn, I know when I can and I will, and there will be 20, 30, 10, 15, whatever number of people on the lunch and learn. And that lunch and learn is structured in a way that it means that we introduce one another, we talk about it, and then we do the lunch, then there's the lunch and learn. Or if I don't want to hear from any, anybody in two weeks because I've got to really nail this project, I do that. And if I want, and but I know that I have a weekly meeting with my manager. I know that I have, so one of the things that Hotjar does, for example, is they, they build they build tribes. And so they take one person from sales, one person from customer success, from marketing, from engineering, and from ops, for example, and they build this tribe. So these five people meet once a month mm. and they either work on a company challenge or they work on their own thing that they want to work mm. on. 
And now you've got these tribes, which are not teams. Once again, it's about intentionality. It's about a new operating system. It's about thinking, of, it's about thinking outside of what we currently know. And it's about helping people understand that we are not going to replicate. You're never going to have the same amount of fun drinking a beer at your, you know, drinking a glass of wine or a beer here versus going into the pub and drinking it with 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 eight of your colleagues or twenty of your colleagues. It's just it's it's not comparable. But what we can do is we can make the biannual uh, weekly get-togethers amazing, amazingly uh connecting and 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 gravitating towards so it's just it's the way it's it's this it's ultimately it's moving to, it'll take us another three four five years to work out what this operating system is for the companies that are slow it'll actually it'll probably take them 10 years to work it out because digital the transformation to digital for large organizations took a long time um, they just thought, let's put some computers in. They didn't think they needed to change the culture and the operating system of the organization to make digital work, to make the internet work for them. And that's the same here. We're going through the same transformation. Lovely. Uh, Brett, you can see that I'm like, my head is exploding with ideas. It's, I already benefited from some of your ideas and your research. Um, I am really thrilled that you were able to share this with our audience. Where can people find you um, so they could start getting an edge in that transformation with your with the help of Culture Code and your research? You know, there's culturecode.ai, and where can they find you? Yeah, so so I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter, but if people want to reach out to me directly, it's Brett at culturegene.ai. That's culture G E N E dot AI. Um, I, I do have some books. I've built some training programs as well for hybrid and remote first working. So if you're thinking about this or you want to become more intentional about it, um, really happy to, to, to have a chat. I'm looking to do in-person meetings in, uh, we're doing dinners in London. We're going to start doing some virtual peer learning sessions. So yeah, hit me up. It'll be great. Um, great to, to talk to your audience and uh, Alex, as usual, it's been real fun. Really enjoy uh, talking to you both in camera and in person. So uh, yeah, looking forward to the next time. Thanks, Brett.